Hello and thank you very much for tuning in to the podcast series by the New Silk Road Project. I'm your host today, Charles Stevens, the founder of the New Silk Road Project. This series is dedicated to understanding and raising awareness of one of the most important development strategies of the 21st century, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The centerpiece of the New Silk Road Project, an initiative supported by Jeep, CSIS, Magellan Capital, the University of St. Andrews and Dennis Shirah, was to travel the course of the Silk Road Economic Belt from London to Yiwu in eastern China, interviewing the key actors and academics along its course. We will have to apologise in advance for some of the tangential moments in this podcast series and also the variable quality of audio footage. We do hope this series sheds important light into China's growing global presence and the significant changes taking place across Eurasia. Turkey has long functioned as a very important node between East and West, connecting Europe and Asia. Alti Atla, Associate Professor at Koç University, expressed this opinion, showing how Turkey can play an important part in the wider transit corridor along the middle corridor of China's Belt and Road Initiative. He also spoke about China's acquisitions of ports in the eastern Mediterranean, several of which we visited, such as Comport, just outside of Istanbul. This painted a vivid picture of Chinese involvement in a region which it has previously been distant from. Yeah, well, first of all, welcome to Turkey. Welcome to this, uh, well, in my opinion, uh, a very important segment of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, welcome to the place where the continent meet, <laughs> let, let's say so, where the East meets the West. Well, I'm, I'm a lecturer in international relations. Uh, I have a PhD in international relations, relations and I'm uh, more interested in the economic dimensions of international relations because I believe that, you know, economics is shaping everything in this world. So I believe that you know, uh, every political issue in international relations has actually an economic background and an economic consequence. And likewise, every economic uh, action and at the international level uh, is taking place within a political context. So these two are uh, cannot be separated from each other. So I'm trying to understand the uh, linkages between the two. My geographical uh, focus is on Asia Pacific, especially China and then Southeast Asia. And uh, so, uh, and since I'm living in Turkey and I'm involved in international relations with a focus on Asia, I'm also doing uh, Turkey's relations with Asian countries. Uh, so, and for years actually, we had a focus on the Western world, uh, also in the uh, teaching of international relations but you know we are living in a global world and Turkey is a member of the G20 and Turkey is a global actor so uh, a one-sided focus uh, looking only at the West uh, is you know missing the picture actually so I'm doing my best to understand how Turkey is interacting how Turkey is shaping its relations with uh, with, uh, with all these countries to its east actually starting with the Caucasus Central Asia and of course Asia Pacific uh, so that's basically what I'm doing uh, I'm uh, teaching at Koch University I'm also teaching at uh, other universities uh, on a part-time basis I'm uh, also trying to contribute uh, to the business community through my consulting work uh, in, in these areas and well that's what I'm doing and it, it's interesting that you stress the importance of, of, of economics given what you said about Turkey sitting at a crossroads between East and West. What do you see as the importance of geography in that equation? Well, uh, just look at the map. And just if you look at the map, you will see that Turkey is literally, geographically, physically, uh, the bridge uh, between East and the, the connection point. I mean, I think in Turkey we have made excessive use of the bridge metaphor. Uh, and most of the times, uh, not really, uh, you know, uh, understanding or, uh, you know, being able to explain what it means in the Turkish case. Uh, but geography tells you that Turkey is the connection point between the east and the west. Well, this is, as I said, geography. You can't change this. 
but geography explains many things. It explains economy. Well, thanks to this location, Turkey is close to the European markets, to the Middle Eastern markets, and the Central Asian markets. Turkey is an energy transit uh, hub uh, between the producers uh, to its east, uh, oil and gas producers uh, uh, to its east, and the consumers to its west. Uh, west. And also culture. I mean, Turkey is at the crossroads. So we hear, and you will see in the following uh, few days, that uh, so this country is all about the mixture of different cultures, of their interaction, the interaction between uh, and uh, the coexistence, cohabitation between different cultures. So and yeah, well, and, and how, how important do you think the Belt and Road is to Turkey, and which components of it do you think are the most important? Well, the Belt and Road Initiative is very important uh, for Turkey from the Turkish perspective. It is important because. It is, in my view, uh, opening up a new window of opportunity for Turkey. It's an opportunity for Turkey to realize, to bring into existence, uh, and in physical terms, in concrete terms, it's, you know, uh, bridge metaphor. So, uh, thanks to this uh, initiative, thanks to the bridge uh, Belt and Road Initiative, I, I think that Turkey can now uh, really uh, transform itself into a bridge between the East and the West. Now, for this, to start with, of course, we need the infrastructure. Turkey needs to improve its infrastructure, physical infrastructure. Now, most of the uh, transportation within Turkey, most of the cargo transportation and passenger transportation is done through land roads. Well, we are a country of people who love to travel by car and by bus, interstate bus, okay? But the thing is, uh, you know, we need the railroads. We need uh, railroads, we need high-speed railroads, and we need, uh, most importantly, intermodal transportation. So that's the future. You need to connect the things. You need to connect the train to the port. You need to connect the ferries uh, to the trains and to the trucks and, and so on, okay? So, uh, and now, thanks to this initiative, Turkey uh, is sees now, uh, with this initiative, Turkey sees now uh, an opportunity to improve its own uh, in transportation infrastructure within Turkey and, of course, beyond, beyond the frontiers of Turkey. Now, this middle corridor project of Turkey, for example, it aims to connect the Turkish system to, uh, with the Caucasus through the Caspian Sea to Central Asia and beyond. Then on the western side, Turkey is connected through Greece and Bulgaria with the rest of Europe. So, you know, it's all about connectivity. Can I, can I reverse the question then? Does this make Tur Turkey vital to the Belt and Road Initiative, given the opening up of the ferry link between Odessa and Anakilia, given the instability in the Middle East and places like Iraq and Syria, and also the growing strength of the Northern Corridor? I think it does. I think it works both ways. It goes both directions. At the end of the day, a bridge is, con is you know, going in two directions. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Turkey has also a very important place for the project, for the initiative itself. Now, uh, well, at the moment, we see instability in many different places. To our south, you know, there's a civil war, there's terror and everything. It's a human tragedy, uh, and it will end sooner or later. I mean, none of the wars in world history has lasted forever. Uh, well, I simply hope that this one won't take as long as the European 30-year war or 100 years war, definitely. But, you know, soon it will come to an end. But even then, Turkey is one of the most feasible routes, one of the most, uh, let's say, most efficient routes uh, for this. Again, it's all about geography. Even when there's peace in the Middle East, even when you have less uh, troubles to our north in Russia and Ukraine, so Turkey will remain uh, as one of the feasible routes. And the Belt and Road Initiative is, at the end of the day, is not about only one single route. It's also about diversification of connections. So because you don't want to put all the eggs in the same basket. So, well, uh, through Turkey, go ahead. But if you are also able to go uh, from the southern uh, part, through the Middle East, 
through the Maritime Silk Road and through Russia, through Ukraine. Let's combine all of them into a you know, more comprehensive network uh, of uh, logistic, uh, logistics of transportation lines. And, and what is the Vision 2030 initiative and how will it help strengthen Turkey as a strategic land bridge? Well, Vision 2023 is a very comprehensive uh, strategy. Uh, it's not only about uh, infrastructure. Uh, it has many different components. It's all about, you know, bringing Turkey uh, to a higher level uh, in the uh, international order, in, in global economy, uh, in general terms, by the year 2023, which happens to be the centenary of the uh, Republic of Turkey. So, uh, of course, uh, one part of the, to this vision relates to economy and which in turn relates uh, to infrastructure. As I said before, you know, Turkey needs to improve its infrastructure links to improve its capabilities within the country because trade is about logistics. You can produce something in a factory but if you can't take your final products to your customers, that's useless. Uh, so you need intermodal transportation, you need uh, you know, combinations, you need networks of different modes of transportation. So 2000, uh, for 2023, Turkey has certain targets. Well, one of these targets is actually to improve, to increase the share of railroads in cargo and passenger transportation. So that will uh, provide uh, an additional impetus uh, for uh, Turkey's trade with the rest of the world uh, as well. So, uh, so we are looking forward to it uh, and we are working uh, towards it, of course, uh, to improve the infrastructure, to improve the economy in general terms, to improve the production capabilities. So they are all parts, parts of the package, of the Vision 2023 package. But this uh, Vision uh, 2023 package has an international component. It's all about improved connectivity with the rest of the world. And first and foremost, of course, with the neighboring regions. Well, when I'm talking about the, with the rest of the world, uh, I'm not really talking about improving our connections with New Zealand. So, uh, well, by the way, New Zealand is a very nice country and we have a certain amount of trade with them. But of course, the priority is uh, to have better connections with uh, the new neighborhood. Uh, and and, you've, and you've, talk, you've talked a bit now about, about Turkey as a strategic land bridge. <coughs> what role can Turkey play on the maritime road? Yes, uh, well, uh, in Turkey, among the academia or the business community, so far, uh, the focus when it comes to the BRI, the focus has been on the land routes, on the railroads, and we actually have a number of intergovernmental agreements with uh, with the Chinese. So we signed an agreement. Actually, it's not a full agreement; it's a memorandum of understanding, but it's still something. Uh, we have this with the Chinese on the harmonizing of the Middle Corridor project with the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. We have a memorandum of understanding for cooperation in the railroad industry and so on. But I think the Maritime Silk Road is also uh, offering very significant prospects for cooperation between Turkey and China. Uh, because, as I said, this is not only one single way of transporting goods. It's not only about railroads. Well, with the railroads, you can come to a certain point. Then you will need the ferries. You will need all these big, you know, huge uh, container ships. So we, what we need in this part of the world is a better, more extensive, more efficient uh, logistics network, not just uh, railroads. And uh, the, uh, the ports, the maritime Silk uh, Road and the Ports involved, ports taking uh, their part on this uh, maritime silk road will be uh, an important part of the strategy. Now, the Chinese have already invested in uh, in a port in near Istanbul, Kumport. You have been there, so. But there are, as far as I know, there are uh, projects, there are intentions uh, to you know uh, to involve more Turkish ports uh, within this uh, framework. Now, last year in May, when there was this big uh, forum in Beijing, the Belt and Road Initiative International Forum, uh, which was opened by Xi Jinping, 
and uh, which was also participated by many uh, heads of the state and heads of uh, governments, including uh, President Erdogan himself, also President Putin of Russia. So there when uh, President Erdogan made one of the opening keynote speeches, and he said, I'm paraphrasing of course, he said that uh, we are very happy to work with the Chinese on, uh, in this port near Istanbul, but we are also willing uh, to include more ports. And he mentioned explicitly three more ports. One of these ports is the Chandarlı port, which is near Izmir, which happens to be right across the sea from previous ports, Athens and Izmir. So the other port is Mersin on the eastern Mediterranean coast of Turkey, very close to the Syrian border, Mersin. And the third port is, is actually Zonguldak Filios, uh, which is on the Black Sea coast. So another economic region. So Black Sea coast, eastern Mediterranean and Aegean coast. So uh, Turkey will have a more... Uh, a, a more significant uh, place in the, I think uh, Turkey will have a more significant uh, part, place in the Maritime Sea Road because I think what matters is to establish a network uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Prius on itself is not enough, is not sufficient because we are talking about like a big chunk, a large portion of the global trade which will pass through this part of the world. So Prius is not enough. It has to be combined uh, with other ports. Turkish ports, Israeli ports. Chinese have already invested in the port of Haifa. Uh, so they will all uh, establish a network of ports. Um, what synergies can be created by this? S coming synergies. in? Synergies. What synergies? Well, uh, synergies, they can, all these ports, I think they can simply uh, share the workload. Uh, you know, they can share the workload. Turkish ports can complement Prius and others. I'm not saying they will replace. I can see that Prius has become a gate of entry uh, for the Chinese into the European markets. But the thing is, it's not only the European market. Eastern Mediterranean is much more than Europe. It's also Middle East, it's also North Africa, it's also Central Asia, so it's also, it's, it's Eurasia. So uh, synergies can be established by combining these ports into a, a comprehensive network of ports through the Chinese enterprise, through Chinese investments, through cooperation between the Chinese and the Turks and the Greeks and the Israelis. Now, in, I think Israel is very important in this aspect because there's the port of Haifa and there's this project uh, called RedMat, which, uh, uh, which aims to connect uh, the Red Sea. Uh, you know, if you look at the map of Israel, Israel, the southern part of Israel is, you know, it's, it's triangular, it's like narrows down uh, and it ends in the port of Eilat at the Red Sea coast. So the, the purpose is to connect Eilat on the Red Sea coast with the port of Ashdod on the uh, Israel port on the uh, Middle East coast. So just imagine that if, if and when this happens, that will be an alternative for the Suez Channel. You can bring the goods from, uh, bring the containers from China, uh, unload them in uh, Eilat, a short distance to Ashdod and then put them uh, on other uh, container ships which will take them anywhere in, uh, in Europe. So uh, therefore, you know, what I see is, is a network of ports uh, and synergies between the ports which is developing in the Eastern Mediterranean and it will be more and more important in the near future because one thing is Europe will recover from the effects of the crisis Europe is, has already done much and uh, Europe will, uh, you know, make progress. So demand in Europe will be higher. But at the same time, when the war ends in Syria and when it's time for reconstruction, so uh, these ports will be more important. 
because there will be you know, a lot of reconstruction work and you will need these ports to carry the construction materials and everything. And how has Turkey's growing relationship with China impacted its transatlantic relationship? Okay, well, to start with, I want to you know, uh, say that Turkey's relations with China are developing uh, independently from Turkey's relations with the West. So, so you can say that well, Turkey has growing relations with China, and at the same time, but but at the same time, Turkey has a lot of troubles with the West and so on. But these two things are not related uh, with each other. I mean, China is the second largest economy in the world. China has initiated the Belt and the Road uh, Initiative, okay? And uh, China is making investments all around the world. So even if today Turkey had the best of relations with Europe, uh, Turkey will still have this kind of positive relations with China. So now uh, I see it this way. I was in China like two weeks ago. I was in Beijing. And I wanted to get from, I was near the Tiananmen Square and I was trying to get somewhere because the police, but the police closed the road and we couldn't go anywhere. And then I realized that it's actually Angela Merkel pass, passing. Uh, a German delegation led by uh, Chancellor Merkel was uh, visiting Beijing. Now, a few months before that, uh, Emmanuel Macron was uh, in Beijing. Then Theresa May uh, was in Beijing. They signed, all of them signed, billions of dollars worth of agreements, of commercial agreements. But nobody is talking about, you know, uh, for example, uh, the French axis is shifting from the west to the east, or the British axis after Brexit uh, it's shifting towards east, uh, or the German one. But whenever Turkey is getting close with China, or with Eurasia, or with Russia, or with the Muslim world, there's always a talk about whether Turkey's uh, axis uh, is shifting. Why does, this, why does this false dichotomy exist? Uh, well, it's, it, it's, uh, well, I think it's produced by people uh, who are still living in the Cold War. <laughs> that, that's a, a Cold War relic. Axis, I mean, you had the axis, axis is, what's the plural of axis? <laughs> axis is. Uh, uh, you had them back in the Cold War. Today we have the global world. Okay, we have uh, multilateralism in the, uh, today. We have interdependence today. We have a world, a global world, defined by interdependence today. So you have to be able to interact with everybody at the same time because this is well, this is basically what the system dictates. Okay, in the Cold War it was uh, not like that. And Turkey was part uh, of an axis, the Western axis. But now you don't have this anymore. And despite all the rhetoric on the uh, side uh, of the White House in Washington, D.C., despite all the Trumpian uh, discourse of, you know, uh, you know, you know it, uh, or, or this, uh, you know, uh, increasing the tariffs against the Chinese and getting the jobs back, and, uh, you know, despite all these things, America and China are so much dependent on each other. And they have to talk to each other. They do talk to each other. And nobody is talking about uh, how America can do that when they are a NATO member. Okay, so uh, I think the rest of the world has to stop looking at Turkey through this perspective. There is no, Turkey's axis cannot shift because Turkey doesn't have an axis. Turkey is a global player, so you don't have axes uh, in su such a world. So therefore, uh, okay, so what Turkey is doing is engaging with the second largest economy in the world. Well, whether we can do it efficiently is, of course, another question. Uh, we are at the beginning now. We need to have more progress in our relations with China. But this has nothing to do with Turkey's transatlantic relations. Turkey's relations with the West still exist despite fluctuations, despite ups and downs uh, from time to time. But for the time being, we are down. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's, 
it will be only a matter of days. They will go up again, okay? Uh, but at the end of today, Turkey is still a member of NATO. Turkey still is doing. Turkey is still doing half of its trade with the European Union because not only because we are uh, close to Europe, but we have a customs union with Europe. Okay, China simply cannot replace uh, this relationship. Okay, China, uh, Turkey is trying to diversify its relations. Turkey is not looking for alternative partners. Now, if you look, for example, at the uh, investment uh, figures, if you look at the foreign direct investment coming into Turkey, which is important for Turkey because Turkey is a current account deficit. If you, have, if you are a deficit country, you need to balance it with a surplus on the capital side, which means you need to get more investment from abroad. So it's crucial for Turkey. Now, if you look at uh, numbers uh, on a country basis, you will see that Chinese investment in Turkey is only 4 or 5 percent of the Dutch investment. I'm not even talking about the European investment uh, as a total. So I'm just talking about the Dutch investment. So Chinese investment is just 4 or 5 percent of the Dutch investment. So and and on, that, on that note, can we touch on Japanese investment? Because I know yes. it's something that you've recently written about. Well, when we talk about diversification, when we talk about uh, Turkey's uh, approach, Turkey's opening towards the non-Western countries, uh, and by the way, of course, those uh, the terminology, those terms like the West, the non-West, I mean, they are of course open to debate. But you know, let's say non-European or non-American countries, uh, if you like. Well, uh, Japan has been here before. China is a newcomer, relatively newcomer. We are now, only now to, uh, beginning to talk about Chinese investment coming into Turkey. But the Japanese have been here since the 80s. In the 80s, uh, Japanese investment came here. Uh, later in the 90s, uh, they uh, made use of the Turkish Customs Union with, the, uh, with Europe because they came to Turkey, invested in Turkey, started production in Turkey, uh, especially in automobile and electronics industries. And from Turkey, they could export to European markets without paying tariffs, thanks to the uh, Turkish, uh, custom, Turkish customs union with Europe. Then there has been a slowdown, uh, mostly because of the, you know, uh, the so-called lost decades in Japan. But now I can see that uh, there's a renewed energy in this. The Japanese are again very much interested uh, in Turkey, despite all the troubles that Turkey has been having uh, for the last two or three years, the you know attempted military coup and uh, the terror attacks and everything. Uh, Japan has a renewed interest here. Do you see a, a Sino-Japanese competition going? Uh, so far, we are not there yet because uh, you know Japanese have already been here. They have invested so much in the, uh, you know, in the uh, in the manufacturing sector, but the Chinese are more interested in infrastructure. But when we talk about infrastructure, the Japanese and don't forget the Koreans, the Japanese and the Koreans did actually a lot of work uh, with respect to, especially transportation infrastructure. So I think in the future there might be competition. We are not there yet, but infrastructure, yes. The bridges over Bosphorus, they have been done with Japanese uh, support. Uh, or I came here, I came to our meeting uh, using the subway. The subway cars in Istanbul Metro are made in Korea, for example. Those in Ankara are made in China. So you can see actually the beginnings of competition. If you take the subway in, uh, if you take the subway, if you take the metro in Istanbul, you ride on a Korean car. If you take it in Ankara, you ride on a Chinese car. So there might be, especially in the infrastructure uh, industry, uh, I think there will be uh, competition uh, between uh, China, Japan, and also Korea. And how much stronger do you think the turkish china relationship can develop with the ongoing problem in, 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 in Zhejiang? Mm -hmm. Uh, the Uyghur issue uh, in uh, the Uyghur uh, community. 
uh, who are uh, a Turkic and Muslim uh, ethnic minority uh, within the People's Republic of China. And so far, uh, for a long time, there have been uh, an issue of conflict between the two countries. But things are changing. Things are changing because everybody is seeing now if the Uyghur issue remains as a conflict between the two countries, nobody has anything to win from this. Nobody has anything to gain from this. But everybody are set to lose. Now, uh, if, the, if this conflict, if they continue to be a conflict, if somehow this conflict is somehow uh, escalated by the sides, uh, everybody are set to lose from this. Now, if you look at it from the Turkish perspective, okay, we do care for the uh, Turkic and Muslim brothers and sisters in this region, okay? We care for their well-being, we care for their economic rights, social rights, cultural rights, their rights to practice their religion and so on, okay? That's a fact. But what can we do about this? That's the question. So, well, the only thing you can do about this to use your leverage vis-a-vis -vis the government in Beijing, vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese government, okay? Because Turkey has some kind of a leverage thanks to, the, thanks to its position on the Belt and Road Initiative. And let's turn the Uyghurs, let's turn this community, let's turn the Uyghur community in Xinjiang and in Turkey as some kind of a catalyst uh, between uh, the two countries. I don't want to uh, use the bridge metaphor again and again. But, uh, you know, actually, that will be the best uh, solution for everybody. Now, Turkey can support the Uyghurs, but at the same time, rejecting any kind of action against the territorial integrity, uh, jeopardizing, jeopardizing, jeopardizing the uh, territorial integrity of the People's Republic of China. Support the Uyghurs, as citizens of the People's Republic of China and do not by any means support explicitly or implicitly any kind of separatist action uh, which will threaten the territorial integrity of uh, People's Republic of China. Now this will be also uh, desirable for the Chinese because the Chinese have always had their suspicions uh, whether the Turks are supporting uh, separatist movements in Xinjiang and so on. And how do you think China's growing relationship with Saudi Arabia, given the tensions between Turkey and, and, and some, some, some areas in the Middle East, will affect these dynamics? Well, so far, uh, I don't see any effect. Well, Chinese are getting more and more involved in the Middle East affairs. I can see that. And the way I see it, that uh, the Chinese are trying to be more active, not only economically, but also politically but refraining from uh, taking, directly taking sides. Okay, in Syria, uh, they are pro-Assad, which conflicts with the Turkish position, of course. But uh, the way I read the Chinese position is, they say that the Assad regime is the legitimate uh, government of, the, of, uh, of, of Syria, but at the same time, the Chinese are also talking to the Syrian uh, opposition. So they are not closing doors to anybody. So the way I see it is that the Chinese are trying some kind of trying, uh, in, a, in some way they are trying to position themselves as uh, actors of intermediation. So but if they can succeed, if they can really produce any concrete results, that's another question. Uh, Middle East is very com uh, complicated, but uh, I think uh, that the Chinese position is also welcomed uh, by the Turks because they are uh, involved economically and uh, on the political uh, side they are uh, trying to do intermediation, they are trying to come up with uh, plans and with solutions and so on, and they are not involved militarily. So the, Rus the Chinese are voting the same way like the Russians do in the United Nations Security Council, but 
There are also limits to that. When it came to military intervention in 2015, when the Russians sent their planes to Syria, the Chinese did not take part because, and this is a position uh, which is, I think, also admired by the Turks. But Turk, Chinese involvement in the Middle East will be more and more important uh, for Turkey in the near future, when the war ends. Because that will be the time for reconstruction of Syria and Iraq. Okay? And the Chinese, uh, it's, I think it's very obvious now that the Chinese will be the main actors when it comes to reconstruction, because they are already involved. Now, as we are talking here, they are already doing some business in Syria. They are, you know, uh, one of the big Chinese companies is laying down the internet net, uh, network uh, in three uh, Syrian cities. There are plans to establish a Chinese industrial park uh, near Damascus and so on. And, well, China has the capital. China doesn't have a historical baggage. The Chinese have never bombed the Middle East. Uh, and the Chinese is also not getting, uh, they are also not getting involved uh, militarily at the moment. So the Chinese will be able to come when the war ends and they can say, they will be able to tell the people uh, of the region, you know, uh, we helped you in your worst days. So we never took sides against you. We never killed you. Uh, we always uh, tried uh, to bring, you know, economics here, investment here, capital here, and now we have the means to further the contribute to uh, you in this very important vital stage uh, of your lives, the reconstruction. So I see a great potential for the Turks and the Chinese to work together in the reconstruction of the region. And looking at other forms of cooperation along the Belt and Road, as one of your hats being as an academic, what educational partnership have you seen between Turkey and China? Okay, so this is uh, a growth area now. Now, my generation, you know, for example, let me tell you my story. I was very interested in Asia when I was doing my undergrad studies. I studied economics here in Boğaziçi or Bosporus University, uh, its English name. So, uh, and that was in the 90s, and I, I came to be interested in Asia because that was the time of the Asian crisis. Everybody was talking about the Asian tigers and how they were collapsing and, and so on. So, you know, I wanted to understand Asia, but that was the 1990s, okay? Nobody in Turkey was going to China or to Japan or to any other Asian country to do graduate studies. So I said to myself, Okay, I want to be in that part of the world, but I could perhaps stay within my comfort zone, like uh, the English-speaking world, perhaps. So I went to Australia to study, okay? I, and, but that was uh, actually one of the best times in my life. But now it's different. We have students who study uh, Asia uh, here in Turkey, then go to China or Japan or even uh, some other countries like Singapore for their graduate studies. Some of the students are even going to uh, China for their undergraduate studies. But I think this is very uh, valuable because they spend four years, their formative years in China, they learn uh, the language very well, they understand, they come to understand the Chinese mind, their way of, you know, interacting with others, their way of uh, doing business and so on. And uh, when these uh, kids come back to Turkey, you know, they will, be the, uh, they, will be, they will be very important for the further development of the relations. Now, with respect to education, with this generation of uh, people uh, in their 20, early 20s, we have a lot of Turkish students going to Asian countries, going to China to study. If you look at the other direction, the opposite direction, uh, it's not that developed yet. We don't have that many Chinese coming to Turkey, uh, which is understandable. But well, Turks are going to China to learn the, the new superpower of the world. Uh, well, to be honest, I don't see the same motivation for the Chinese uh, to come to Turkey. Uh, but still we have some um, Chinese students 
mainly coming to Turkey on an exchange. Uh, we have students who are studying the Middle East and they want to you know, stay and live in Turkey and study Turkey and the Middle East. So this is also beginning, but Turkish students going to China, uh, this is the real growth area. And you see, you mentioned China being the new superpower of the world. Do you see this as being inevitable? Uh, but okay, so I was a bit caricaturizing it a bit. But superpower, because how do you define superpower? Uh, being a superpower comes with responsibilities. Now we see, for example, uh, Donald Trump uh, trying to get rid of those responsibilities. Now the Chinese themselves, uh, their position is, they say, well, we are still involved, we are still uh, putting in our efforts for our own development. Because we, st we are still a developing country, they will say. Uh, the Chinese, I'm not sure they are willing to take on the responsibilities of a superpower. And, uh, well, in the future, I don't know. But for the time uh, being, well, uh, I can, I will say America, the United States of America is the only superpower in the world. So uh, responsibilities or the economic uh, hegemony, the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, the Chinese renminbi is uh, nowhere near that. Or military, I mean being a superpower requires a military that can project that is able to project its power all around the globe. So the Chinese military is not there yet. So and and we are not going to see that in the uh, in the medium term uh, either. In the long term, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, well, if we talk about the powers, America comes first. Then we can talk about ch from China and maybe also European Union uh, and so on. But that's just it. But. China is still the second largest economy in the world, whether you call it a superpower or not. And you talk a lot about a, a, a globalised world and a globalising world. Bruno Mackenzie is the, the author of Dawn of Eurasia. I don't know if you're aware of the book. I, I just ordered the book from, and um, let's not mention the name, uh, but okay, I, I ordered it from Amazon.com. <laughs> the, 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 the author I, I know was in Istanbul three days ago. And oh, okay, I didn't know he, it. He, he, argues in, he argues in his book that Eurasia is, is, is breaking down from its autonomous disparate regions and is becoming a coherent and contiguous whole. Do you believe that Eurasia is, is becoming as interconnected as that? If you look at it from an economic perspective, to a certain degree, yes. Yes, we have increased trade connectivity. We have the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, on the, uh, from the Russian side, we have the Eurasian Economic Union. We have all this, uh, we have, uh, all this uh, economic networks remaining from the Soviet times in the former Soviet uh, area and so on. We have these things. We have increasing economic connectivity and, interdependence, and therefore inter interdependence uh, between uh, these countries. But if we, when we, uh, it's not only about economy, of course. It's also about politics and security and so on. So uh, there are, for example, if you look at the main powers of the Eurasian uh, supercontinent, these are probably Russia, and China, and perhaps we can include India as well, because now that India is a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, there as well. Well, fine, but other than economic uh, economics, other than uh, that certain degree of economic interdependence that they do have, uh, I don't see, I don't really see much that brings these countries together. Well, of course, Soviet Union was something else. It was a it was an empire based on ideology, but, but now the era of ideologies is gone. Now, communist ideology is definitely not something that brings Russia and China close to each other, okay? So, uh, but Eurasia, yes, we have, a, uh, we have an improving economic structure in this supercontinent, and uh, Belt and Road Initiative is a very important component of that. Uh, but uh, if you go beyond the economics, for the time being, I don't really see much uh, that will that could serve as a glue that will uh, you know put these countries together. And how do you think 
perceptions and public awareness has changed about the Belson Road Initiative in Turkey. If you're happy to expand on it, both within the academic unit community, the journalist community, the think tank community, and maybe more broadly. Okay, well, that's a very good question because that's the uh, that's the point where the biggest problem uh, about the uh, Belt and Road Initiative from the perspective uh, lies. Uh, so we have a problem of perceptions. Uh, the perception of China in general is still very poor. It's very, still very underdeveloped in Turkey. Now, it's very unlike the Japanese and Korean perceptions in Turkey. If you talk about the Japanese, everybody loves the Japanese and the Koreans. Well, for us, for the Turks, the Japanese, I, I'm now talking about the general public, okay? Uh, for us, uh, the Japanese are you know, very nice people, very kind people. They had an economic miracle. They invented so many things. They created miracles. Okay, fine. Koreans, well, we fought with them, uh, like uh, together in the Korean War. So we have this shared heritage of the Korean War. And besides that, well, the Koreans are very nice people too. But when it comes to the Chinese, we don't have the uh, same uh, positive level of uh, perception. Well, uh, China is still predominantly associated with the perception of poor quality products and uh, at the human to human level we don't have we still don't have much contact with the Chinese despite all the tourists coming to Turkey and so on uh, you know uh, Turks uh, interaction with the Japanese and the Koreans is something else it's something else, it's different and it's very positive. But with the Chinese, it's not that. And, so, uh, and uh, for this, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is uh, it's only at the very beginning of its life, perhaps. But in Turkey, uh, it's uh, making a start from a very actually negative base. So, because Belt and Road Initiative, okay, Chinese trains, because the railroad uh, development is very important. You know, everybody will be very happy to ride the Japanese train, the Korean train. But if the Chinese come up here with a higher sp sp speed railway, people will probably have some question marks about riding on a Chinese train, which uh, like make, which makes like 400 kilometers per hour. Okay, they will probably hesitate. Okay, I, this is a misperception, of course. Okay, but that's the fact too. This is something we need to improve. Uh, if you look at academia, of course, there's a more objective uh, perception of China. Uh, the academia is trying to understand China, and there's increasing links between the Turkish and Chinese academia and the think tanks. And the business community is very enthusiastic about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, not everybody really knows uh, about uh, what BRI actually is, but they are still very happy, very very excited about it. Okay, uh, they can see that opportunities will, will be coming. They are not quite sure about what these opportunities will be, but uh, they, I mean they are very open uh, to it. They want to learn about it. They are they want to make the contacts, and then when the time comes, uh, they want to be involved uh, directly. So, but at the society, at the general public level, uh, the biggest problem uh, is that in Turkey there is still a negative perception of uh, anything related to China, and uh, we, and here we means Turks and the Chinese together, uh, need uh, to improve this. And how does this perception differ among political elites? About political elites, I, again, I, I, I see a, a very positive uh, way of, uh, you know, uh, not only perceiving, but politicians are also, well, they are policy makers. They, are, they don't only perceive, they also act. So, but lately I see uh, that the way that the Turkish politicians are perceiving and dealing with China and the Chinese is improving very fast. 
especially over the last two years actually. Over the last two years, we have seen the dialogue between the uh, Turks and the Chinese. I'm talking about the politicians and the bureaucrats. Uh, the dialogue at that level improving very fast, very fast. Uh, and, uh, now, and of course there are reasons to that. There are reasons and the number one reason is the Belt and the Road Initiative and the uh, expected mutual benefits. I cannot talk about real benefits so far because we are at the beginning yet, but expected benefits, uh, there are many. So uh, mainly thanks to that, uh, the dialogue has improved a lot between the Turkish politicians and the Chinese politicians. Uh, we, for example, we have seen the establishment of intergovernmental uh, dialogue platforms, or uh, you know, uh, other you know mechanisms like that, and they are meeting uh, a few times every year. Uh, Turkish politicians, I think. The Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, was in China yesterday, perhaps even today, I, I'm not sure about that, but lately he was there and the Chinese uh, high-level officials are coming to Turkey very often and I think this is important, this dialogue and the positive perception is important because it's also, uh, it is also related to the Uyghur issue. As I said with respect to the Uyghur issue, the most optimal solution to this is that Turks and the Chinese work together, okay, to improve uh, the Uyghurs, you know, cultural and economic and social rights, while at the same time accepting them as the citizens of the People's Republic. And on that note of, 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 of overarching issues, what do you think is the greatest challenge for the Belt and Road Initiative in the next five years? Uh, again, misperceptions. If we can't if we can't achieve improvement on that side, okay, uh, there will be resistance to, uh, of uh, against Chinese involvement. Well, so far uh, we haven't seen, for example, we haven't really seen like large-scale demonstrations against Chinese involvement here. Uh, for example, you have been to the uh, port, the Chinese-owned port here in Istanbul. I mean, there has never been kind of a reaction against. Uh, the fact that the Chinese are now owning that port, but uh, but there will be more and more Chinese involvement in Turkey. So uh, when the Chinese will become more visible in the Chinese economy, when there will be more Chinese uh, residents in Turkey, like workers, like business people, and so on, uh, if we cannot solve this problem of perceptions, there might uh, be negative reactions against increased Chinese presence in Turkey. So therefore that can derail uh, the Belt and the BRI uh, existence uh, within uh, Turkey. And if you were going to sum up the Belt and Road Initiative in one word, what is that word to you? That word will be interdependence. We depend on the Chinese and the Chinese depend on us. But that's not only Turkey and China. Everybody depends on each other in this global world. But uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is now uh, an instrument to make this, in, to further improve this interdependence, and more importantly, to turn it and to translate it into concrete outcomes, which will benefit everybody.